How many of you know that God is in control? If you believe it, clap your hands. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. God is in control. All you have to do is just give it over to him. Amen. Amen. You may have your places in the presence of the Lord. Let's give this choir a wonderful hand clap. Been enjoying them all day long. Amen. Amen. We are up to the body of Christ. Amen. To change the hearts and the minds of people. Y'all can get quiet. Hey man, the devil, did you know the devil will send people to church? Hey man, the devil ain't got real people, but he'll send the counterfeits into the body of Christ. And that's the reason why, hey man, you've got to be careful about who you yoke up with even in the house of God. Hey man, everybody that's shouting and speaking in some kind of tongue ain't got the Holy Ghost. You still got folk that the devil has sent in to be a negative example. Hey man, before the eye of those young ones that are coming seeking a better life and a different walk. Amen. But you've got to be careful and you've got to know that that's not God. That's why we've got to preach to you the word. Amen. Because the word of God is a lamp and a light. Amen. It's going to shine on all of those motives that other people are trying to hide. And I don't care how good they talk. What you've got to learn how to do. Amen. It's measure their conduct by the word of God. Oh, Lord, everybody that's speaking in tongues and trying to prophesy to you, amen, ain't doing so by the Spirit of God. The Bible says you try the Spirit, y'all. I'm trying to figure out if I got somebody here that know the Word. Amen. He says you've got to try the Spirit. I don't care, amen, if they look like they saved. Try that Spirit. Look, y'all ain't said that they prophesied. You ain't got to just submit to every word that folk trying to speak over your life. You try that Spirit. And how do you try the spirit, huh? By the word of God. Oh God, somebody said you try the spirit by the spirit. No, you try the spirit by the word of God. Because the word of God is already settled in the heaven. Isn't that what the scripture tells us? Amen. Psalms 119 and 89 says forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. If you don't like it, you can't do nothing with the word. Amen. The apostle used to tell us you got to go to heaven to change this word. And by the time you get there, change it, it ain't going to be on your mind. Amen. So we try the spirit by the word of God. So what does that tell us? That tells us we got to know this word, don't it? Amen. You got to know what it says for yourself. And that's why I feel bad for people. Amen. That say I can't go to church because I know this about people. And I've seen people do that. They don't know the word. Because if they knew the word, they would realize the Bible never said, amen, measure your life by people. He said Christ left us an example. Oh, look at somebody and tell them Christ is my example. I ain't worried about who lying. I ain't worried about who cheating. Amen. I ain't leaving the church because of shysters. Amen. Christ is my example. Uh, thank you, kind spirit. He, he's who I look to. Amen. He's the one that lights me up. Uh, amen. He's the one that gives me direction and, and gives me instruction. Amen. He's my role model. And I don't care what else is going on in the name of the Lord. Amen. I'm looking to Christ. Uh, he is the author and the finisher of my faith. Yeah. Thank you, kind spirit. You you gotta realize, hey man, the devil is not a
water was cold. Uh-huh. It chilled my body, uh-huh. but not my soul. Uh-huh. If you don't believe, uh-huh. I've been reading. Uh-huh. Come on and follow me down uh-huh. to the Jordan stream. Uh-huh. Said the Jordan River, uh-huh. it's chilly and cold. Uh-huh. Said it chilled my body, uh-huh. but not my soul. Uh-huh. Anybody been to the river? Uh-huh. Anybody been to the river? Uh-huh. Anybody been to the river? Uh-huh. It's been to the river. Uh-huh. Said the Jordan River, uh-huh. it's chilly and cold. Uh-huh. Said it's chilly and cold. Uh-huh. Said it's chilly and cold. Uh-huh. Said it's chill my body. Uh-huh. It's chill my body. Uh-huh. But not my soul. Uh-huh. But not my soul. Uh-huh. Anybody been to the river? Uh-huh. Anybody been to the river? Uh-huh. Anybody been to the river? Uh-huh. Did you take a dip uh-huh. into that river? Uh-huh. Did you take a dip uh-huh. into that river? Uh-huh. Into that river? Uh-huh. And when you came up, uh-huh. did your hands look new? Uh-huh. Did your feet look new? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Anybody been to the river? Uh-huh. Anybody been to the river? Uh-huh. Let me see you wave your hand. Uh-huh. You been to the river? Uh-huh. Do you remember your day uh-huh. when you went to the river uh-huh. and you took the dip uh-huh. into the Jordan River? Uh-huh. And when you came back up, uh-huh. did you feel alright? Uh-huh. Did you feel alright? Uh-huh. Did you feel alright uh-huh. when Jesus came uh-huh. and He cleansed you up? Uh-huh. Did you feel alright? Uh-huh. Did you feel alright? Been to the river? Uh-huh. Anybody been to the river? Uh-huh. Did you step in the water? Uh-huh. Did you step in the water? Uh-huh. Did you take a dip uh-huh. into that river? Uh-huh. When you took a dip uh-huh. into that river? Uh-huh. Did you cleanse your soul? Uh-huh. Did you cleanse your soul? Uh-huh. When you took a dip? Uh-huh. Did you take a dip? Uh-huh. When he baptized?
the Holy Ghost. In the name of the Holy Ghost. In the name of the Holy Ghost. Will you be baptized? Have you been baptized? In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. And the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost. Yeah. his holy name. Thank you, Lord. He's worthy of all the praise. He's worthy of all the glory. Come on and put those hands together. Yeah, Lord. Come on and put those hands together for the choir. Didn't we enjoy them? Awesome job. Come on and put them together for our conductor. The testimony Put them together for our pastor, Apostle Murray, Lady Danielle Murray. Put them together for your brothers and your sisters, for our visitors, for the friends. Now put them together for Jesus. Come on and put those hands together for Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Look at him and tell him, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, it is the sweetest name I know. No other name whereby a man must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. You may, may be seated at this time. Hallelujah. We thank God for this moment, this time, this opportunity. I don't take it lightly, and I do solicit your prayers. Certainly, we've had an awesome time throughout the day already, right? Amen. This morning, we had an awesome time, didn't we? Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And we're going to get right into the word on tonight. Go with me to the book of Acts, the second chapter, and we're going to be coming from that 42nd to the 47th verse. And on tonight, I just want to take my time, and, and when I say take my time, I don't mean long, but take my time and <laughs> make it plain. All right. Amen. And I just want to encourage all of us as the body of Christ, as a church on tonight, because as the return of Christ draws near, and I always say it, we'll find out even if you hadn't got there that we need one another. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, I need you. You need me. We're all part of God's family. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. Hello, somebody. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, I love you. I need you to survive. Yeah, yeah, I need you to survive. We need one another, and we find strength from one another. Hello, somebody. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, you got a gift that uh, it's supposed to edify me. Your gift that God is giving you through the Spirit is not for you, but it's for the body of Christ. It is to perfect me. It is to edify me. It is not for you to get lifted up in and of yourself because the gift was given. How can you boast in that which you did not possess. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, I need you. You need me. And on tonight, I want to just talk about the strength of the church. Yeah, yeah, the strength of the church. And if you bear with me, we're going to make this plain, and God is going to get the glory. Is that all right? Acts, the second chapter, the 42nd verse, through the 47th verse, it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship 
and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all they believed were together and had all things common. Mm -hmm. And sold their possessions. Ain't that something? And goods. Mm. Did they take it to the pawn shop to get something in exchange? No. And they did what? Parted them. That's what the Bible says. Is it in your Bible? And parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. While they were doing this, they were praising God and having favor with all people. And this is what happened. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The strength of the church. As we look back, we want to know what's going on during this time. Many devout Jewish males from far and near have made their pilgrimage back to Jerusalem for one of their three solemn feasts, this one being the Feast of Weeks, the, which in the Hebrew is the Shavuot, Shavuot. The Feast of Weeks takes place approximately 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. All three feasts require that first fruit, somebody say first fruit, first fruit offerings be made at the temple as a way of expressing thanksgiving for God's provision. Therefore, during the partic this particular feast, which we're talking about, the Feast of Weeks, they were required to, as the Bible says in Leviticus 23 and 16, to present an offering of new grain unto the Lord. Like other Jewish feasts, this one foreshadowed the coming of the Messiah. So just as these men brought their first fruits of grain, the Lord sent the promise of the Holy Spirit to these men that they were in turn to become a first fruit of the church. And we know right here in the book of Acts, this is where the Holy Spirit makes his arrival. Amen. God had already promised, and this was the pouring out of God's spirit upon all flesh, as Peter had to let the people know because they felt like these men are drunk. We hear everybody in their language. It was a language. It was a language. It was a language. It was understood. It was a language. Because you got to remember, God at one time when man become, became to become prideful, when they began to build up the Tower of Babel, when they understood one another, God confused them. But now we have right here where they were confused, now they understood one another. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then right here, we look at all the time, we always focus on the power of the Holy Spirit. But tonight I want to look at the practicality of the Holy Spirit. What we must realize is that, yes, the church started in power, but the church is going to have to continue with some practical things. And what are they? We see them right here in the scriptures. But first, before we go forward, what is the word strength? What does it mean? Strength is the capacity of an object or substance to withstand great force or pressure. That's the strength of something. And most of the time, you, you have to test the strength of uh, something or the quality of it to see what it will withstand. And all of us, when we go through our trials and temptations and situations, circumstances, uh, chaos, calamity, all of these things, this is the testing of our faith. And we go from faith to faith, and you can go only from faith to faith. In the middle is the testing time. Because that's how you are strengthened, is through your testing and your trials. And we are strengthened through our tests and our trials, but at the same time, we're just not strengthened. There are some things we have to do, even individually, but even more collectively. So we always say, and I always I'll think about this, sometimes uh, 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 we always say, I want to be like the first century church. 
Do you really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be like when they, you know, Peter preached his sermon, 3,000 were added to the church, and everybody was there, and they walking in power and so forth. Not only were they walking in power, they were dealing with persecution. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, it's more that comes with this. This is why you can't now preach the gospel based off of somebody being blessed with a home. I can't promise you that God is going to bless you with a house. You may be in efficiency for the rest of your life. I will not tell you that. I will dumb down the gospel telling you that God is going to bless you with natural things. There are principles. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, uh, running over. Shelly calls men to give unto your bosom, but their giving can be in any kind of way. You can give of your time and you'll get more time from others. You can give of yourself being a gracious person and in turn you will receive more grace from others. How are we strengthening the church? Let's look at what it shows right here because when we look right here, we see the establishment of the church. And anytime you want a, a, a better understanding of something, you have to go where it first started. You have to look at the origins. You have to look at how did the church start off and what was the church doing if we want to be a successful church. Look at somebody and tell them, maybe this is what we're going to have to do if we want to be a successful church. There's nothing, no quick get rich and all this other kind of stuff. No, no, no. Okay, let's get in the word. Let's see what the Bible says. We already read it. 42nd verse, it says, and they continue steadfastly. In the apostles' doctrine. Somebody say apostles' doctrine. What was the teaching of this apostle? Says it was from Peter's sermon. After the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And just to summarize it. I won't read all of it. But you can look at the previous uh, verses. Uh, It says in verse 36. It says. uh, Sums it up this way. Therefore let all the house of Israel know. Assuredly. That God had made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both the Lord, which is God, and Christ, which is the Messiah. So he let these Jews know the same one uh, uh, that you crucified, he's both Lord and Christ. His name is just, uh, 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 his name is Jesus, but his title is Lord and also Christ. He is the promised Messiah that you all have been looking for. The very one that you were looking for is the very one you killed. And the very one you killed because of you, even though it was part of the predetermined and foreknowledge of God. See, you must understand that nothing happens outside of the knowledge, outside of the will, outside of God. Look at somebody and tell the neighbor, if you got it, God allowed it. Come on, somebody. If you got it, God allowed it. God has all power. He's omnipotent. He's all-knowing. He's omniscient. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows what you're going through, but he wants you to still cast all your cares upon him because why? He cares for you. Basically, Peter preached Jesus. That's what he did. This is what the Apostle Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 2 and 2, for I determined to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Until a person understands the significance of the cross of Christ, there's no use of talking about, te- talking to them about the blessings of Christ. Because they haven't, ever, they, have, they haven't even accepted Christ. So why would I tell you about the blessings of Christ? Why would somebody allow you, why would a company allow you to uh, 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 receive off of their 401k and you don't even work for the company? That don't even make sense. Look at somebody and tell them they don't make sense. You have to be an employee to receive the benefits. You have to be a child of God to receive the blessings of God. Yeah, I know he reigned on the just as well as the unjust, but the ultimate blessing is eternal life. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, that's the ultimate blessing. You can have the house, you can have the car, you can have the money, you can have the clothes, you can have the fame. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, but give me Jesus. That's all I want, but give me Jesus. Because I found out all of this stuff don't matter. All of this stuff don't make me. Before I got saved, I thought it made me. But when I got saved, I found out that it would cause me to be a slave. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, but I'm free. free. 
everything begins with Jesus and Jesus is the word. And not only is he the word, he is the living word. Not only do we have Jesus as the living word, we have the written word. And according to 2 Timothy 3 and 16, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration means God breathed. Yeah, yeah, even though a lot of times people love to say, is this a book written by men? Or is this a book about, how do they say it? Is this a, is this a book of God written by men or is this a, ah, never mind. You know where I'm going. Look at somebody and tell them, it was just God breathed. God was in it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, which are the teachings of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Not only that, for reproof, which is rebuke, for wrong behavior, but uh, belief. Sometimes the word will rebuke us for our wrong thinking, our wrong behavior, our wrong conduct, our wrong character. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, I just want to be right. And sometimes the word has to come across and God rebukes us. But we find out that God chasing those whom he loves. I thank God because when he chased me, because I'm not a bastard, as the Bible say, I'm not an illegitimate child. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, I have a father. I have a father. Even if you didn't know your father on this earth, look at somebody and tell a neighbor, I got a father. I have a father. What is the word good for? It's good for correction. That word means restoration. And even us as children of God, we have a ministry of reconciliation. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, you have a ministry. Don't wait to get called. Don't wait to get ordained. You already have a ministry, and it's called reconciliation. So look at somebody and tell a neighbor, go reconcile somebody with the word of God. You already have God's word. Go ye into all the word and preach the gospel. Go out there and proclaim. That's the word preach. The word preach means to proclaim. What are you proclaiming? You proclaiming who Jesus is and what he has done. So you are a preacher, so stop saying you're not a preacher because you have been called to preach the gospel. You have been called to proclaim who Jesus is and what he has done. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, go preach. Some of y'all quiet. And it's for instruction in righteousness. In other words, training for godly living. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, we, we, need the word. we need the word. We need the word. So what is the strength of a church? First of all, the foundation, everything has to be predicated. Everything has to be centralized according to the word of God. That's what's going to build a church, and that's what's going to build you as a child of God. You have to search the scriptures. That word search means to examine. You have to scrutinize the scriptures. You have to look at the scriptures like the Bereans would do. They would go back when people would say stuff. They would go back home and see if what they said was true. That's what you have to do as a child of God. If somebody says something, don't take it for that. Go back home and search the scriptures. Examine the scriptures. Scrutinize the scriptures. Get in there and cross-reference the scriptures to see if what a person said is true and doesn't it really line up on line upon line and precept on precept does it really line up with God's word look at somebody and tell a neighbor search the scriptures that's what's going to build you so if we're going to be a strong church if we are going to have strength not only individually but collectively we have to value the word of God we have to value the word of God the next one within there it says and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine is the word of God and what? Fellowship. Fellowship. And I'm going to put fellowship and breaking of bread together. There's a quote that says, no man is an island. Y'all heard that quote, right? Yeah, no man is an island. Many think it's an old adage or proverb while others think it comes from Shakespeare. However, this is an actually a quote from a sermon from the 17th century clergyman named John Donne, who was the dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. And this word fellowship in Greek is the word koinonia, which also along with it 
is the word fellow, along with the word fellowship, it is also speaks of association, community, and joint partnership. When these people became followers of Christ, they began to come together and form a community. Somebody say community. community. One of the results of building community, they broke bread together. This could mean both the coming together for the common supper, the communion supper rather, rather, or the common meal. So in other words, they would either come together with communion and reflect on Christ, or they would come together with just actual meals. Look at somebody and tell the neighbor, either way it go, they came together. Amen. Yeah, yeah. It's something more when we come together as a Christian family because we begin to know one another in a more personal way. We begin to gain trust and create a closer bond. Because of this trust and bond, by way of fellowship, it leads us to another characteristic of a strong church. And somebody say prayer. 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 There are many scriptures that deal with, prayer, deal with prayer. However, I want us to look at one that is more personal and only happens because of our closeness and our fellowship and before I get into the prayer even looking at the fellowship don't you don't have you notice the difference when you get with your brothers and your sisters outside of church yeah when we when we come together we go out to eat or, or we go to the park and we hang out you begin to find out that a person that you thought wasn't cool like you're all right with me you know what I thought you was you know buster <laughs> You all right, man. You you cool. And then you find out the ones you think that don't know too much. You'll find out, wow, you have a lot of wisdom. Yeah. And then the ones that you look over, you'll discover that they offer more value. And I don't mind saying this because I'm up here. So many times we esteem the people that come up here. And I'm, called, I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about the pastor. I'm just talking about us, people. I'm, I'm, I'm because you look at the people up here as if they have more, for lack of a better word. You, you look at me like I'm closer to God. Uh, you look at me like God loves me more. Am I helping somebody? Uh, 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 you you can get it twisted that God will use them, but he can't use me. I, 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 I've done too much dirt. Why? Why? But but he, you, uh, you don't know how much dirt I did. So don't get it twisted because the person that holds the mic like me tonight, I'm no greater than you. But you're no greater than me. But what is greater? Greater is he that is in me. Come on, somebody. Than he that is in the world. When you feel like you're not valued, Christ makes you that much more valuable. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, I'm something. But I'm only something because of him. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> Without him, we're still nothing. But with him, oh, my God. <laughs> Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, I am somebody. Look at him and tell him, you are somebody. You are valued. Hello, somebody. God has esteemed you. God, God loves you. You are cherished. You are honored. Hey, come on, look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, speak over yourself. Talk to yourself in the mirror. When the devil begins to talk to you, go in that mirror. You talk to yourself and look at yourself and say, God loves you. God loves you so much he thought enough about you that he died for you. He loved you. So what if they don't love me, but he loves me? So what if they left me, but he would never leave me nor forsake me? Maybe others have turned their back on me, but God is still there. Look at somebody and tell the neighbor, I'm loved. I'm loved. I'm loved. You are loved. And it's something about when we come together as people of God, we can start to feel the love. 
One way to destroy an enemy is from within. Let me say that one more time. One way to destroy an enemy is from within. And what we have to be careful is not to allow the devil to come in here and begin to separate us. Look at somebody and tell them, there ain't no clicks in the church. We all clicked up in this thing together. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, we in this thing together. To the day we die, to the time Christ come. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, I got your back. And I hope you got mine. You run, I'm going to run. You fight, I'm going to fight. You go to the left, I'm going to go to the left. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, I'm not letting you go nowhere. We in this thing together. This is the strength of the church. Not your shouting, not your singing, not even your testimony. But it's when we come together as the people of God and we have the like mind. Look at somebody and tell them these are the things that make a church strong. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, I got you. Come on, find somebody and tell a neighbor, I got you. Look at somebody you don't look at all the time and tell a neighbor, I got you. If you need me, I got you. Hallelujah. The devil is a liar. He ain't going to come in here and destroy nothing. Hallelujah. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Jesus said it. Look at somebody tell a neighbor, I'm part of the church. I'm part of the church. And Satan came and can't come in and destroy nothing. This is the strength of the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the strength of the church. Hallelujah. We just got a few more. My God today. Look at somebody tell a neighbor, no division, no schism, no division. No schism. No division. No schism. I need you just as much as you need me. I'm no different from you. I serve the same God. If you a child of God, you got the same power. This is the strength of the church. Come on, I got a few more. We're going to get ready. Let's get this real quick. So besides our fellowship is prayer. James 5 and 16 says this. I want you to hear this because this is a very powerful scripture that we overlook. This brings it home a little more. And this is what we need. We need to be at a point to where we let our defenses down. Look at somebody and tell them, they put your guards down. You probably been hurt out there, but you won't be hurt in here. Let me say that one more time. You probably been hurt out there, but you won't be hurt in here. Put your guards down, put your defenses down. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, this is a safe place. This is a safe place. And how can we allow this to be a safe place? People got to trust us. And some of you have a hard time trusting because of what you've been through, because of what you dealt with, because of a man, because of a woman, because of a family member. 
it's hard for you to trust. And it's hard for you to get close. So you stand back and observe. And sometimes if you're not careful, your interpretation of your observation can end up leading more to separation. Mm. Okay, thank you, Lord. Your observation can lead to a wrong interpretation, which can cause more separation. James 5 and 16 says this, confess your faults one to another. To Jesus, what do it say? To the pastor? To the deacon? Look at somebody and tell them no titles. Just brothers and sisters. I'm just Brother Banks. Confess your faults one to another. And when you're confessing it, there's a, there, this is what you're supposed to do. Pray one for another. Not calling and telling somebody, girl, bruh, did you know what, did you hear what? I thought he was, what? Man, bro, I got to, man. I, man. I can't believe he, I can't believe she. What? Oh. Uh, no, pray for one another. And what's going to happen as a result? Somebody say it. That you may be what? Healed. That you may be what? Healed. When we come into one another's presence, confessing our faults, and we pray, by the time we leave, we should be healed. By the time I'm done, by the time you're done, you should not feel worse. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. Another translation says this for the B clause, it says the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. When we look at prayer, your prayer is just not for you. I need you to pray for me. Look at somebody and tell them, I need you to pray for me. You're a child of God, you already have a connection with God. Come on, somebody. If you're a child of God, you have a connection with God. My prayer is not better than your prayer, Kiana. I don't care how much God used me. My prayer is no greater than yours. Long as you mix it with faith, that's the key. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, just pray. Yeah, you supply the faith, he'll supply the results. Even during the time of persecution, when Peter was in prison, in Acts 12 and 5, it says, But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And we always look at other countries when we see persecution and wars and rumors of wars. And then sometimes we think America is a safe haven. No, no, America has, her, has its day coming. America has its day coming. And we look at persecution. My question to you is this. If we're going to be strengthened, if we're going to be a community, if we're going to have partnership, what's going to happen if people start threatening my house? Can I come to your house? If they blow up this church and they say we can't gather no more in churches no more and the government and martial law comes in, uh, 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 will you open up your home and we still have church? Or are we just going to stop having church all along? Or are you too good for us to come in your house? But I thought we was a community. Not only that, they share goods and possessions. This is 44 and 45. It says, and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to every man as every man had need. James 2 and 15, 16 says this, if a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food and one of you say unto them, depart in place, 
be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Your faith, meaning your life in Christ, should produce good deeds. When you read the book of James, in its context, it's talking about having partiality in favor of people. That's the context of James 2. That's where it's talking about, about faith without works is dead. In other words, you say you save, act like you save. In other words, there should not be favoritism. Do you know when you read the book of James, it calls favoritism a sin? Go back and read it. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a liar. All these things I have not done since my youth up. But you're partial. That is just as much as a sin as a murderer. Because all sin is what? Equally sinful. Look toward the Lord and say, Lord, check my heart. Check my heart. Turn a little light from heaven upon my soul. If you find anything that shouldn't be, come on, look at somebody and tell a neighbor, let the Lord shine a light on your heart. Search me, oh Lord. Search me. Show me me instead of me trying to see others. Show me me. I'm coming to the mirror of your word. Show me me. And not only that, they continue daily in the temple. Hebrews 10 and, 20, 10 and 24 through 25. It says this. I'm going to give you another version. It says, let us... No, let's go to the KJV. Then I'll give you what the, another version says for, for clarity. Hebrews 10 and 24. Let's go there. Let's see what it say. Hebrews 10 and 24 through 25. It says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but this is what we do, but exhorting one another. And he gives more emphasis and so much more. Yeah, so much more as what? As you see the day approaching. Another translation says it like this. Let us think of ways. That's already good right there, right? Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing nigh. This lets us know, according to the scriptures, when we come together, we are to exhort one another and we are to encourage one another. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, when we come together, we are to encourage and we are to exhort. We should not be little. We should not put down. We not, should not make anybody feel less than. We are to encourage and exhort. If I walk in here with my head down, I should not hear you say, what's wrong with you? without helping me out. By the, it goes back. When we leave one another's presence, we're supposed to be better. I should not leave you and feel less and worse. This is how the church is strengthened. We are to encourage and exhort and those were the outward actions the inward actions is this they share their meals with great joy generosity while praising God and God added to the church those that got saved this is the strength of the church so many times we just look at the power and that's good because the church came in with power 
But so many times, if we're not careful, we'll bypass all the practical, everyday things that matter most. The time of coming together. The time of fellowship with one another. Because you don't know what I'm dealing with. And when we come together, you don't know if I'm laughing to not cry. And because we have God's Holy Spirit, we should come to a point to where, man, I'm glad I came to church. I'm glad I spent time with my brothers. I'm glad we took out time to go to the park and just hang out. And I found out even with this as I come to a close. The scripture tells us whether therefore you eat or whether you drink, do all to the glory of God. In other words, we could be having a good time just laughing. But God still gets the glory because there's no cussing. There's no profanity. There's no vulgarity. All the brothers we hanging out, we ain't trying to holler at nobody. <laughs> I'm married. <laughs> uh, and even for you, the single brothers, you know, there's a certain way. You're, yeah, we still keep in other married brothers. We'll help you out. Keep help keep you in the <laughs> right, right, right. But even with that, that's a principle to the point that you don't have to be no, doing nothing, anything so called deep. But let me tell you this anytime you live spiritual, whatever you do is spiritual. So even in your humorous times, your funny times. Just having a good out, good time, laughing and playing is still spiritual because why? All of it's being done to the glory of God. There's no hating. There's no bickering. There's love. And there's a powerful principle. Besides us going to preach the gospel, which we're supposed to, people, if we want to be disciples, which are learners, that's all we are. We're learners of Christ. We're followers of Christ. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is a learner, is a pupil. Because even when the rabbis, remember Jesus was a rabbi, and he had his disciples. And during those times, what rabbis would do, they would walk and teach. And the disciples would follow. They were followers. They were disciples. They learned. We're already disciples and we're called to make disciples. And what allows us to be that much more effective as disciples is the love that we have one for another. How will they know we are true disciples? Not how well you preach. Not how well your speaking the tongue is. But it's going to be the love that you have one for another. Stand to your feet. This is the strength of the church. It's right here in the scriptures. And I just wanted to take my time to show us these things because sometimes we have to slow down. And just like a good crock pot, you let that stuff get in there. Put it on low while you go to work. Put all that seasoning in there and uh, I eat, she cook. <laughs> so I'm not going to act like I'm a cook, but I understand the principles. You put all of those ingredients in there, the seasonings, and you put, put it on low. Or if you have a slow cooker, you let all of those seasoning and all of those ingredients come together to make what you're trying to make that much more seasoned. And the Bible tells us that we are the salt of the earth. You as a child of God, 
Because you have Christ, you are the salt of the earth. We have been called to go and make things better. People sometimes don't realize how bland their life is. They think they're all right. But when they come to Christ, they found out how much joy and peace and righteousness is over here in the Holy Ghost. And they look and say, I've been missing this all this time. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, this is the strength of the church. We're making an altar call. If you need prayer, if you need strength, I'm going to touch and agree with you. Matter of fact, first of all, if anybody need to be saved, maybe you're not part of the church. Because just because you come to church, you're not part of the church. Okay? The church is not the building. The church is the body. Yeah, yeah. You have to come and be part of the church by way of repentance. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's what Peter preached. He preached Jesus. And because he preached Jesus, 3,000 souls were added to the church. And that's what it's going to take. The raw, unadulterated gospel. And sadly, so many churches have gotten away from the word of God. They want to entertain versus enlighten. Enlighten through the word of God. And so tonight, if you're not saved, we ask you to come down. We'll pray for you. But if you are, I want you to, I want you to grab somebody's hand. Grab somebody's hand. Everybody, even the ushers, if you don't mind. Even the ushers, if you don't mind, because nobody's coming down. I need you. You need me. Even if you got to stretch through the aisles, make contact with somebody. You can use sanitizer after it's done if you need to. But let us make contact with somebody. Because this is the strength of the church. Father, we come to you right now. We humble ourselves before you, Lord. First of all, we want to thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the blood sacrifice. Thank you, God, for how you allowed him to lay his life down for us. When the Holy Spirit came in, that was the start of the church. And, Lord, it is our desire to continue on as the church, to represent you well, Father. Let our lives be founded on your word. Let our lives be founded on fellowship. Let our lives be founded on prayer. Let our lives be on sharing our possessions with one another. That if my sister lack, she has it because I have it. If my brother need it and I got it, I'm going to supply it. Father God, let us have that mentality. Let us have that attitude. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And when we do come together, let us exhort one another. Let us encourage one another. Let us be strengthened by one another. Let us find the value in one another. Father God, we thank you. We want to say thank you for our pastor. We ask you to continue to strengthen our pastor. Apostle Murray, we thank you for him, how he continues to lead us. Father God, strengthen the man of God, strengthen the woman of God in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us not for, take it for granted the leadership that we have, Father God. And so we say thank you, Lord, that when we walk through these doors again, the next service, that we'll come with the heart, with the mind, not only to hear your word, but to live your word. That if my brother is down, if my sister is down, that I will pray for them. That I will allow them to begin to trust me by fellowshipping with them. So that way if they need somebody for them to pray about, to pray, to cry with, to moan with, to tarry in prayer with, hallelujah. I'm going to make time, hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's worth the sacrifice because Christ, you sacrificed for us. 
And that even if persecution come, that we will open our homes, we will open ourselves to one another, Lord God. This is the prescription of a church that is strengthened. And I pray that if anybody is weak or feeble in the spirit, we pray for strength even right now. We pray for comfort even right now. And so, Lord, we say thank you. Strengthen us. And we thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Into the hands of our conductor. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand wave on tonight. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. For that great word we heard on tonight. For that encouraging word we heard on tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, bless your name, God. Glory to God. We thank you, God, for the man of God on tonight. Hallelujah, they brought that great word, God. God, we pray that we would hide that word in our heart. And God, that we would be doers, not just hearers of your word. Hallelujah, but be doers in Jesus' name. Glory to God. We have some announcements on tonight. Hallelujah. Prayer for Sister Valencia Horton and family and the passing of her love. Also keep Sister India in prayer, amen, for her grandmother's uh, passing, amen. Mother Shirley Kirkwood will be on Tuesday, March 12th there in LA, California, and flowers can be sent to McKay South Bay Mortuary um, there in Lawndale. Please see me for the address. Also, all parents, if you desire your children to have an Easter speech, please see me after service. Um, and also, children's choir rehearsal will be this Wednesday, March 6th at 7.30 p.m. Also, we are soliciting submissions for the Women's Convention book, including... Praise God. To be included, here is what you need. A yielded life. How have you chosen to yield your life to God? Advice to my sister. The Bible says that a word spoken in due season is good. Proverbs 15 and 23. Share some encouraging words or scriptures to help your sister through life's challenges. A general testimony. Let us know what God has done for you in the past year. Please send all words and pictures to designteam at fjhg.org by Monday, March 18th, 2024. And I just like to say that I thank God for the word on tonight. I thank God because the support that I felt over the past two weeks has been immense. That's why I'm here today, because you all have been praying for me. And so I'd like to thank the church at this time for the support and the love that I felt. And then I just wanna appreciate you, amen. And we'd like to welcome our guest on tonight, Brother Christopher Hodge, amen, the brother of Brother Christian Hodge, amen, we thank God for you, Brother Christopher, welcome to Garland Full Gospel, please join us as often you would like. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, thank God for those announcements, we're standing, everyone's standing on tonight, let's give Brother Banks another quick hand clap on tonight. 